interesting story. This story and this picture goes back to a, a story that we have all um, learnt and shared over the years. And one of the things is Nicodemus comes to him. Now, who's Nicodemus? Ni Nicodemus is a theologian. Matter of fact, I would put him up with a, a lecturer at college. You know what I'm saying? He's, he's a lecturer. And he lectures on theology. He knows the Bible. He knows the Old Testament through and through. I don't think you could trip him up on some of the, on the Bible subjects. So where did he find his inadequacy? He felt there was a need in his life and he says, I'm going to sneak out, I'm going to catch this Jesus fella and I'm going to ask him some questions because he seems to have lots of answers. We as Pharisees have been sitting back and talking about all the things that we do. I want to know Jesus. I want to meet him and find out where he comes from. And he sits down there with Jesus and he talks to him about who he is and they have a good old yarn a couple of hours have drifted by and they're asking questions and Nicodemus says to Jesus, how can I become the person that God wants me to become? How can I do that? And Jesus gives him this really interesting uh, statement, one that challenges each of us. He says, you must be born again. He says, how can I be born again? Do I? It is impossible for me to go back to my mum and be born again. That's impossible. Jesus says, if you're not born of the water and the spirit, you're not born again. You are who you are, and you're going to be lost where you are until you're born again. Yeah, it's a challenge. It's a challenge for all of us to make up our mind, do we want to be born again? That's the question. Do you want to be born again? I hope and pray that I get a chance to meet Nicodemus in heaven. Eh? He was with Jesus. He saw the beauty and love of the character of Jesus and I'm desiring to meet Nicodemus in heaven with many others. So, yeah, I think that... Uh, God has a way of dealing with us. We have an advocate in heaven. And that advocate is going to change who the devil says I am. And if the devil gets a chance, he would say, Peter's not worthy of heaven. But Jesus says, I saved you. I died for you. And you have... I have you in my heart and I want you to be with me in heaven. Oh... Doesn't that ring in your ears as a beautiful statement? Doesn't that encourage you to say, I want to be God's child. I don't want to continue the way I am. I don't want to be who I think I can be. I want God to lead my life. I want God to take me into the future so nothing can change. God has a plan. He says, I'll put my spirit in you. But me, yeah, yes, I'll put it in you. And I'll put it in all of you. My spirit. God has a plan for us and he's going to make that happen. And as Nicodemus found out, the kingdom of heaven, we see kingdoms, we see powers, we see places. But the kingdom of heaven is different from what we picture. Many of us think of kingdom being, I'm going to glory and I'm going to live in God's kingdom. Did you know that in the Lord's Prayer it told us different from that? It said, thy kingdom come. The disciples had to discover what that meant. It meant God's peace, love, joy and long-suffering could come into their lives that they become the kingdom of heaven, eh? Isn't that what the kingdom of heaven's about? Here, right now, in Eight More Plains and the suburbs where you live, people are looking. They're watching and they want us to be part of God's kingdom and them as well. Wow. 
I think that's exciting. A lot of us are going to have some fruit over the Christmas. I don't know what you're having on your tables, but a lot of those things on that picture look pretty good to me. And it says the fruit of the Spirit. So this is, this is not the tree, not the plant, it's the fruit. And what's the fruit experience? It's like tasting, experiencing, enjoying. And it says the fruit of the Spirit, that's the fruit that God puts into our lives, makes us lovable, makes us joyful, makes us peaceful, forbearance. Now, what's forbearance? Well, we can come up with words. We're wordsmiths, most of us. Forbearance, it's kind of like patient, thoughtfulness, forbearance, yeah. Kindness, isn't that a lovely word? Some people just naturally ooze out of them, their kindness. Goodness, wow. Faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Well, give us a lot of those, Lord. I need every one, don't you? That God can use our lives in such a way that we can become his children and exhibit that. Would that be the best way the Spirit could work in my life today, right now? I'm sure it is. That we can become what God wants us to be with all those words. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. I think they're amazing statements and you couldn't think of better words to say what God can do for us. When God worked what he had and he came to the completion of it at the cross, the best part of the cross was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Who got beaten that day? Who got beaten at the resurrection of Jesus? Satan did. Yeah, thank you. Satan did. Why did he get beaten? Because the gift he gave Adam and Eve was death. And for all of us, right through to now, a gift that none of us want but comes naturally, death. I'm glad that we as Christians and Seventh-day Adventists believe in the second coming of Jesus. It's in our name, you know. Adventist means we're looking forward to the coming of Jesus. And, you know, if that's not the answer to the world's problems, nothing is. It's the greatest belief that we have that we believe that Jesus is coming again. Matter of fact, we've got a few songs in our songbook that says Jesus is coming again. I, I'm really excited about that thought. And our bodies will be changed. I remember my dad at 75 when he died. He didn't look all that good. Not from the young dad I remember. The vitality and that he had in his youth when I was born and grew up in them early years. But he's going to... Guess how I'll know my dad. Guess how I'll know him. He won't come as an old fella. He'll come as a vitalised person that, I don't know, we would call it probably in there 25 to 30. Maybe. Let's not go there, but let's say that I'm going to know him. How am I going to know dad? How am I going to get excited? This is dad and go to him hug him and say, Dad, through Jesus' grace, we're in heaven, eh? He says, and he, his word, first words will be, G'day, boy. He called everyone boy. If you're a, a male, you're a boy. And he says, and me, I grew up knowing, he hardly ever called me Peter. It's, hey, yeah, go on, boy. And he, him and I, when I went and helped with his funeral, I told stories about that. But I did say, I'm looking forward to meeting my father in heaven, eh? As the people that you're desiring to be there, and I pray that that's our experience to share the gospel of Jesus Christ until Jesus comes. And this year, 2024, is our year. And you say, how many of us are going to be around at the end of it? I don't know, but let's make it a good and positive journey. Acts 1 8 says, But you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So, can we pray ourselves into that position where we are ready to see the Holy Spirit? I think it's more about God 
seeing our need, fulfilling that need and changing us. Can we leave here today without a desire, each one of us, that the Holy Spirit will come upon us? I pray for you young people. You know, you've got the best part of life. I, I would go back there if it was possible to be a young person again. And I look around and we normally have a church full of young youth. We are excited to see the youth. And I think that uh, as a church we should be encouraging, giving them jobs to say you are a member of our church and you're one of our leaders. Eh? But I'm looking forward to seeing the church be run, organised and blessed by our young people for they are our future. Churches that hang on to the leadership roles with old guys like myself, it's a pity. We need to see the youth, don't we? We need to see them grow and be blessed. So where does this leave us? The Holy Spirit will come upon us and we will be God's blessing. Yeah, it's like we're going to be a blessing in Eight Mile Plains. We're going to be a, a blessing in Brisbane. We're going to be a blessing in Queensland and to the uttermost ends of the earth. You know how we rephrase that, rephrasing that? That's true. The Pentecost is all about that. The latter rain that God's going to send upon this earth will happen to us. How many of us are going to be willing? How many of us are going to take that choice? And how many of us are going to go into the future with the total confidence that God's going to lead us to a, a great outcome? No matter what we want for ourselves, there's a better, bigger and better desire for our lives. I'm looking at the clock and saying, well, we've had enough. But I want to tell a story. And I can't tell the story. I don't deserve to tell the story. So I'm going to ask my wife to come up here. And she's shaking her head. I know she would. That's why I didn't tell her that I was going to ask this. Come on. Come on, Lenny. You know what I'm going to ask you. You know... Why did you put me into this? Put you on the spot, I do love to put you on the spot. <laughs> um, so what's the story? The story is it happened while we are in Tassie. Lynn and I got up early one morning and it was very early, I can tell you. And we headed from Smithton, uh, which is, I, I'm trying to work out in kilometres, but... Three, it would, three hours drive. Three hours from, that was from Devonport to Hobart. Yes. But we w headed from Smith and two hours west. So we did five hours drive to go to ministers' meetings in Hobart. So we had five hours to go back home. Big drive, eh? And... Um, Is Tasmania that big? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and we got to the ministers' meetings. They started at nine o'clock. We were there, so you can guess what time we left home. And uh, on the way back, Lenny, Lenny, I want you to tell the story. <laughs> so she's keen already. <laughs> yeah, I've got no, far I'll tell enough. I'll the story. Yeah, yes. I, I'd rang my dad in Sheffield, and that's about um, halfway, isn't it? Approximately, anyway. About two more hours back to Smithton from Sheffield which is on the northwest coast. And um, <clears throat> as we were approaching the area, um, I had this very strong um, thought in my head about a lady who lived in the area. Um, we'd met her um, previous to this. We'd been asked to go and visit her. And she asked that nobody know that where she lived, to, for us to tell no one else where she lived. Um, and so <coughs> I was getting towards Sheffield and thinking, well, I really need to see this lady. I re we really need to go and visit this lady. And that strong uh, thought was coming into my head. And, um, and I said to Peter, um, I think we need to go and visit Maureen. Her name's Maureen. And um, she'd had a lot of hurts in her life. And, but... She always would say, you're, you're, you're welcome to come and visit. 
me but don't tell anyone else where I live. So I'm thinking, well, we need to go and visit her. And so I say to Peter, we should go and visit Maureen, which is very close to where my dad lived. And it meant for us to go through a gate up a hill and to another gate and it meant uh, not just a drive to the front door. So, and um, Peter said, um, you know, like, we've gone all this way, you know, like, what are you saying, you know, and don't, didn't really want to go at all. No, I did not want to go. To visit. Anyway, mm. so it was very strong in my mind and I said, yes, I think we should go. And we went to her house, went through the first gate, I got out, opened the first gate up a hill, then to the next gate and there's dogs at the, big dogs at the gate. I'm scared of dogs. <laughs> and so I get out and say it's okay and um, so we go to her door and we, she comes out and we go inside. We're sitting talking to her and um, didn't know why this strong impression had come into, into my mind and uh, we're sitting chatting to her and uh, she starts to cry. She said, how did you know to come today? We said, well, we just were near my dad's and I felt that we should come visit you. And she said, um, well, I, I, I said, why, why are you asking? Why? And uh, she said, because my son in another state had committed suicide the day before. And it wasn't till that happened did we realise the strong impression was from God to go and visit her? So we prayed with her and she said, thank you so much for coming. I've got no one that I can actually talk to. I cannot go to the funeral because of the relationship with her husband. And she couldn't even go to the funeral, the son's funeral. But it was just amazing. God led us that day to there. And that was a strong impression God had guided. And um, I thank God to this day that... Um, that uh, he led us that day to her. So, Thank yeah. you, darling. I've never forgot that day because I objected. I was wanting to go home to Smithton. She was going to call in and see Lynn's dad and then we're going to head home. Two hours drive. It was still about five o'clock. We'd been going since early hours. All I wanted to do was go home and I kept on saying, Lynn, why do we go and see her tonight? We'll come back two hours sometime in the future and we'll go and visit. No, Lynn said, I feel that we should. And I keep on saying, if that wasn't the Holy Spirit, it was not anything. It was the Holy Spirit all the way and my wife listened. My wife listened to the Holy Spirit and we ended up at her house and did we bless her? I don't know. She certainly blessed us because we recognised how God works in our lives if we listen. Amen? Oh, yeah, big amen deserved. Because my wife listened. We worked together for 18 years. Lynn went everywhere that I went. We were the only husband and wife team in Tasmania where my wife worked every day with me. We knocked on doors. We, our, our prime objective was to, to visit people and love them and pour our love upon them. I don't know and I can't answer it, how the Holy Spirit works. But I know it does. I do know, and that's why I wanted Lenny to come and share, because I know that if we listen, it will happen. If we are part of it, you will be blessed. As Lynn and I will never forget the day we met Maureen and her great pain and suffering and need. Are we going to, as Christians, continue to grow? I believe the effects of the Holy Spirit in this city is going to happen. We're going to be part of it. And you say, how long are we going to wait for Jesus to inspire us to be what we need to be to get on with the work? The Holy Spirit came upon them, 120 people sitting in that room, and they were inspired in such a way that they never forgot it. And they carried the gospel to their then known world by the end of AD 100, it was done. We had men like Paul and so on that went ahead and just trusted in God. 
I think the Holy Spirit is available to us in 2024 like never before. It's the power, it's the leading, the guidance that God has sent to us and we need it. I want you to stand, each of you. And this is a stand to say, I'm ready, Jesus. Use me, eh? I want to be used by God in the future. And you can say, and how's he going to do it in my life? I don't know, but I know that he will. And whichever way that God calls you, you will look back and say, I'm amazed. Father, we come before your awesome throne, the most gracious throne on the universe, where you are leader, king and lord and our father. Oh, what a joy it is to call you dad. Oh, you love us. I know what it's like to have an earthly father and I'm so proud to say you are my heavenly father. In the name of Jesus, we come boldly before your throne and we come before your throne with needs, each of us. Our needs are to give away self and put it behind us, to allow you to become Lord of our lives and it put away the bitterness, the anger, the resentment that we have, even for, for one another at times. Help us to be led by Jesus' example. The good news is flowing so freely in a time such as this. So Holy Spirit, you were given to us by Jesus when he left, that you could be everywhere. You could speak to each of our hearts today and we thank you, Holy Spirit, for your wisdom your leading, your guidance, your mercy and the way that each of us have experienced God in our lives through you. We ask today that each of us will put aside ourselves that we can become your children, children of the living God. That from today on, we'll never ever look back, we'll look forward to what you have to do for us. We don't ever want to look back and see the misery and sadness of yesterday's because that's what Lot's wife got caught on. She looked back. She could have looked forward and said, God's going to deliver me. May we each have a heart for knowing your will and purpose in our lives. May the young people here today experience the goodness of God. We pray for them individually because the Satan's out to distract and change their direction. We want those young people ready for eternity as well. So bless them, Lord, lead them. And may they choose you and be baptised and say, we want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Bless them, Lord. And for each of us as we go from here today, may your will and purpose be seen and experienced in our lives as we love you and serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. you to stand and sing with us a beautiful song, Amazing Grace. We'll sing the five verses because it's good to reflect on the song and uh, the message in there. Thank you.
lots of people here today that I don't really know. I hope to say, as I, you're coming through the door, that I, I can say hello to you and let you know that you're loved and valued and we enjoy your visitation. I've got my son, my daughter-in-law, my granddaughter here today and I'm very proud of that. It's lovely. And uh, I think that God has blessed us abundantly as people. I won't say a closing prayer because I've done that. But I want to say God bless you each one.